This is the Olympus OMD AM5 Mark III. It was released in November 2019. It is a mirrorless camera with a micro four thirds sensor. It has a weather sealed body. It weighs 414 grams, including the battery and SD card, which is 55 grams lighter than its predecessor, the EM5 Mark II. The previous version of this camera had a magnesium alloy body, but this camera is made from plastic, which has contributed to its lighter weight. Also, this camera has a smaller and lighter battery than its predecessor, which also contributes to its lower weight. The camera body alone weighs 366 grams. It is 12.53 centimeters by 8.52 centimeters by 4.97 centimeters, excluding protrusions, which is slightly larger than its predecessor, the EM5 Mark II, in all dimensions. The camera has an electronic viewfinder and an articulating flip screen. You can configure the camera so that as soon as you put the electronic viewfinder against your eye, the screen will switch off and the electronic viewfinder will turn on. You have three options for how the eye sensor works. You can enable the eye sensor so that the camera automatically chooses whether to use the viewfinder or back screen based on proximity to the viewfinder. Alternatively, you can choose for the eye sensor to only be enabled when the screen is in a closed state. You can also switch off this feature altogether and do it manually using the physical button on top of the camera. If you press and hold the live view button, it will take you to the menu item to configure the desired behavior, which is easier than remembering where in the menu this option is buried. The camera can be operated using the touch screen, which is particularly desirable when the screen has been rotated to a selfie orientation. The camera has the option to mirror the image when the screen is in selfie orientation. Also, the rotation direction of the focus ring can be chosen in the menu. If you are using the screen to compose your photo when doing flash photography, consider switching the live view boost on so that you can see the subject on the screen with reasonable brightness and frame your subject. Otherwise, the screen will attempt to replicate the existing exposure of your subject which will be relatively dark considering the flash is not on yet. What information is displayed on the screen can be customized. The customization will vary depending on what mode you are in. For example, movie mode or playback mode will have different information displayed on the screen than in still picture mode. Once you have configured what information should be shown on the screen, you can iterate through different levels of information being shown on the screen by pressing the info button which will loop through the custom settings in addition to the default camera settings. You can take pictures using the touch screen, similar to a mobile phone. You can also disable this feature or disable the touch screen altogether. If you use the electronic viewfinder to take pictures and are worried about your face touching the screen, it might be easier to close the screen so it cannot be accidentally activated instead of disabling the touch screen feature. That way you can open the touch screen and use it when needed without having to re-enable it through the menu system. In addition to the main menu system, it has two quick access menus for quickly viewing or changing camera settings for the most frequently needed settings. The live super control panel and the live control menu. To view one of the quick access menus, press the OK button, and to rotate between them, press the info button, assuming you have configured your camera to display both. You can use the buttons and dials on the camera to navigate and change settings using the super control panel or the control menu. To save current settings and exit the quick access menu, you can press the shutter button halfway. In order to be able to switch between Super Control Panel and the Control Menu using the Info button, you need to configure this in the Video menu for when in Movie Mode. If you want both menus to be available, then you have to tick both of them so that you can switch between them using the Info button when in Live View Mode. You need to do the same for Still Picture Mode by going to the Customization menu D1, Control Settings, and the relevant Still Picture Mode for which you want to choose what menus should appear on the screen. 
Once you check the desired menus and options, you can bring up the menu by pressing the OK button and rotate through the various menus by pressing the Info button. If you want to continue to monitor the subject in your scene through the screen while changing settings, then using the control menu, which is displayed on the right and bottom edges of the screen, will be more suitable. But if you want to quickly look at all settings at a glance, then the super control panel is better and quicker to navigate to the settings that you want to change. The camera has a BLS50 lithium ion battery, which is different to its predecessor, the Mark II. The EM5 Mark II had the BLN1 lithium ion battery, which is larger and heavier, but will also last longer. According to Olympus, the battery on the EM5 Mark II could last up to 150 minutes of video recording, whereas the battery on the EM5 Mark III can only last up to 110 minutes of video recording. I managed to record 110 minutes of 1080p video at 60 frames per second until the battery icon started blinking. I was using aperture priority and had the single autofocus plus manual focus option selected, which I frequently use to touch the screen for activating the autofocus function. I didn't continue shooting once the battery icon started blinking, but based on how much I used the camera afterwards, I think I could have continued shooting for another 10 or 20 minutes. The BLS50 battery, which is used on the EM5 Mark III, is the same battery which is used for the EM10 Mark IV. The camera comes with a BCS5 battery charger, which lets you charge the battery externally. The charging time is around 210 minutes or three and a half hours. You can also charge the battery while it is in the camera through the micro USB connector. But the camera cannot be operated. So the camera has to be off when it is charging using the USB connector. The charging time using this method takes about four hours. The camera comes with a USB cable, but not a power adapter to connect it to for charging. But since it supports USB charging, you can charge it using a power bank or a smartphone charger or a computer. Alternatively, you can purchase the F5AC USB power adapter separately. I have an F5AC2 USB power adapter, which was included when I purchased an EM10 Mark IV. And you just plug in the USB-A cable into it, and on the other side you have the micro USB which you plug into the camera. And as soon as you connect it to the power, the light will come on. The LED light on the back indicates that the battery is being charged. It will turn off once the battery is fully charged. If pictures are being uploaded to a smartphone via Wi-Fi, using the background auto upload feature, the battery cannot be charged using USB, even if the camera is turned off. Olympus has this feature that allows pictures to be uploaded using Wi-Fi in the background. This continues in the background, even if you switch off the camera. Under this circumstance, you won't be able to charge the camera until the background upload finishes or you disable this feature. You can turn this feature off to avoid background upload of pictures through Wi-Fi but then you could lose your photos if something happens to your camera or SD card and you haven't completed uploading your pictures. One of the disadvantages of charging the battery externally as opposed to with the USB cable is that some settings may be reset if the battery has been removed from the camera for a while, whereas charging through the USB port could potentially damage the USB port, which means you won't be able to use the USB port for transferring pictures and videos. The USB port on this camera does not feel sturdy. In terms of connectivity options, it has ports for micro USB, micro HDMI, microphone jack, and a remote cable terminal on the left-hand side of the camera. It also has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. The camera has a single SD card slot, which supports UHS-2 SD cards as well as older UHS-1 SD cards. The previous version of this camera doesn't support UHS-2 SD cards. When purchasing an SD card or using an old SD card, it is important that you pay attention to its write speed, particularly for recording videos. 
it appears that Olympus has made informed decisions about how video bitrates correlate with the speed of SD cards that are available on the market. On this camera, DCI Cinema 4K video with IPB compression requires a maximum speed of approximately 237 megabits per second, which is within the range of U3 and V30 speed SD cards. 4K video with IPB compression require about 102 megabits per second. The camera has a micro four thirds sensor with 20.4 effective megapixels or 20.37 million pixels to be exact. This is the same sensor which is used in the EM1 Mark II, EM1 Mark III and the EM1X. So the quality of images will be as good as those higher end cameras. It has a TruePic 8 processor which is the same processor that was used in the EM10 Mark IV, EM1 Mark II, and the EM1X has two of these processors. It has a supersonic wave filter, which helps remove dust on the sensor. The supersonic wave filter vibrates over 30,000 times per second to shake off dust or other particles on the sensor. And once they fall off, they fall onto an adhesive strip, which stops them from making their way back onto the sensor or other parts of the camera. This is a video of the supersonic wave filter used on the EM1X dislodging a water drop from the camera's sensor. The camera has five axes in body image stabilization with 5.5 stops of stabilization going up to 6.5 stops with compatible lenses. In still picture mode, the image stabilization has more options in that you can choose whether to perform the image stabilization in all directions or whether to limit it to horizontal or vertical stabilization only. However, in movie mode, the stabilization cannot be isolated to vertical or horizontal directions. So if you have stabilization switched on while recording video and you pan the camera, the stabilization system tries to counter the panning movement, which results in a jumping effect. It is not possible to change the image stabilization while recording a video. Otherwise, you could somewhat counter this problem by assigning a physical button on the camera for toggling image stabilization. That way, you can quickly switch it off and back on again when necessary. Currently, the recording needs to be stopped before image stabilization can be changed. The camera has digital stabilization for use in movie mode. When digital stabilization is switched on in movie mode, there will be a slight crop to the size of the frame. I couldn't find an exact number for the crop factor. If you are using lenses other than micro four thirds or four thirds, then you will need to specify the lens focal length in order to get optimal results from the stabilization, as these lenses will not communicate with the camera to relay information such as focal length. When shooting still pictures, you can choose whether image stabilization should take priority or if shooting speed should take a higher priority, in which case the sensor will not recenter itself after the first shot. The camera can take photos both in RAW and JPEG or both at the same time. You can configure this on the camera. The JPEG setting has three options for size, large, medium and small, as well as three options for the level of compression, super fine, fine and normal. In the top level menu item for detailed camera options under submenu G, there is a menu item where you can select up to four entries for JPEG size and encoding compression rate combinations. The exact resolution of medium and small can also be adjusted in a separate menu item. Once you configure those four entries, they will be available in the menu item for basic shooting options. In the still picture menu one, you can choose which of the four options you want to use and whether that option should be accompanied with a raw image file or not. If you are using art filters, the JPEG will have the effect applied to it, but not the raw file. So if you have chosen to store both, you will be able to get the original picture content without the art filter applied to it from the raw file. This means you can apply any art effect to your image at a later time and decide which art filter you want to use. The camera has a high resolution mode. This feature allows creation of an image with a resolution substantially higher than what the camera's image sensor can produce with a single shot. Using the tripod high res shot function, the image sensor is shifted in half a pixel increments while the camera takes eight sequential shots, which are then combined into a single 50 megapixel picture with substantially higher quality in terms of resolution, colors, and reduced noise levels. This mode is ideal for product photography, 
or taking high quality pictures of still subjects. This feature can only be used when the camera is mounted on a tripod in order to minimize any movement of the camera between the shots. The camera has a base ISO of 200 but can go lower to a setting almost equivalent to ISO 100 and it can go up to ISO 25600 which is adjustable in one stop or one third increments. The real ISO range of this camera is between 200 and 6400. However, the camera processes images to produce equivalent ISO settings that are out of this range. You can configure the default and upper limit for ISO settings when auto ISO is used, so the camera can stay within bounds defined by you. The maximum ISO that the camera will use with the auto ISO setting is 6400, whereas if you control the ISO manually, you can go up to 25600. You can also define the shutter speed at which point auto ISO should start to raise the ISO sensitivity instead of slowing down the shutter speed. This option is only valid in program mode and aperture priority mode. The camera has highlight spot metering and shadow spot metering to make it easier to get the correct exposure for your pictures. Highlight spot metering has the same effect as increasing exposure compensation by one stop when using spot metering and shadow spot metering has the same effect as reducing the exposure compensation by one stop when using spot metering. These two metering modes are essentially an abstraction on top of spot metering to make it easier and quicker to change the settings without changing exposure compensation. The spot metering modes use up about 2% of the frame for evaluating the correct exposure. You can change the metering modes through the super control panel or via the customization menu under the E3 submenu. The letter E stands for exposure, hence the naming for E1, E2 and E3 menus, which contain exposure related settings. You can only select metering modes for still photography, whereas in movie mode, only the default metering mode is available, which is called digital ESP metering. So if you are recording video, the best way to judge exposure of your scene is by looking at the histogram. The camera uses both phase detect and contrast detect autofocus with 121 cross type focus points. It has single autofocus so you can press the shutter halfway down while the focus point is on your subject and the camera locks focus. Then you press the shutter all the way down and a photo is taken. It also has continuous autofocus which lets you continuously focus on the subject as long as the shutter button is halfway down until you decide to take a photo and press the shutter button fully. It also has an option for a combination of single autofocus with manual focus adjustments, whereby you press the shutter halfway to focus on your subject or use the screen to touch focus to get focus on your subject. Then you can turn the focus ring on the lens using your hands to further adjust the focus manually or leave it as it is. This feature is more useful in movie mode as opposed to photography. But if you are working with old lenses or lenses that don't lock focus accurately, this might be useful. When using touch focus, you can choose the size of the focus area as well as the location of it. In picture mode, there are more sizes available for the focus area than in movie mode. In addition to touch focus, the camera also has a matrix grid of target points from which you can choose a single square, a small square, a five square target group in the shape of a cross or a three by three group of nine squares arranged as a large square, as well as a five by five, 25 square target group, or use the entire grid as a target group of 11 by 11 squares that take up 121 squares. These types of focus areas can be used with single focus as well as with continuous focus. The camera has focus tracking which locks on the subject and follows it, refocusing between shots. This feature is even more useful when recording video to keep the subject in focus. The stickiness of the tracking option is not good for high movement scenes, but works well in studio scenarios or when the background and the subject are separated, or if the subject is distinct and takes up a large portion of the frame. The camera has face priority and eye priority autofocus. You can choose whether the camera should focus on the eye which is closest to the camera or on the left eye, the right eye 
or only use face detection. When face priority or eye priority is used in conjunction with the default metering mode, which is called digital ESP metering on Olympus cameras, exposure will be weighted according to the value measured for the face, which means not only will the correct subject have focus, but its exposure will also be correct. The camera has an LED in front, which helps with the autofocus feature in low light situations. You can turn this off in the settings. The camera has a focus peaking feature and the color of the focus area can be chosen. So if the subject has a lot of red, then you can change the focus peaking color to a different color like yellow or black. The camera has a feature called Super Spot Autofocus, where you can zoom into the image preview and then focus on the exact desired spot before taking the picture. This is useful if you want to be very precise with the focus point or when the subject is very small and difficult to isolate on a small screen. Prior to using this feature effectively, you need to assign this function to one of the buttons on the camera by going to the customization menu and choose submenu B followed by the button function item. There you can choose the desired button and assign the magnify feature to it. The camera has a feature called preset manual focus, whereby you can pre-configure a default focus distance for the camera to automatically adjust focus for that distance when shooting. This option is available for both still pictures and video. This feature is particularly useful for recording video when the majority of time focus needs to be on a specific location or distance, but occasionally you may need to change focus using the single touch autofocus or manually with the focus ring on the lens. Although you will not be able to change this while recording a video, so the recording has to be stopped before toggling between focus modes. The focus distance can be set in three ways. You can set it manually by turning the focus ring on the camera, you can set it by pressing the shutter button halfway, or you can manually enter a numeric value for the distance in meters or feet. The camera has three shutter types, mechanical shutter, anti-shock mechanical shutter, and silent electronic shutter. The anti-shock mechanical shutter option reduces camera shake caused by the movement of the mechanical shutter. The mechanical shutter speed ranges between 1 over 8,000 of a second all the way up to 60 seconds in increments of one-third stops. The electronic shutter can shoot from 1 over 32,000 of a second up to 60 seconds. If you are photographing fast-moving subjects, it is better to select the mechanical shutter as it is less likely to produce a rolling shutter effect in comparison to using the silent electronic shutter. The camera has a silent mode which disables all camera sounds. It will use the electronic shutter and by default turns off camera sounds, the autofocus, illumination LED and the flash. You can change the settings for silent mode to choose whether camera sounds, flash or autofocus assist LED should be switched off or not. The camera has a bulb mode with a dedicated bulb mode option on the mode dial. Bulb mode allows you to do long exposure photography, which can be useful for shooting dark scenes. In bulb mode, the shutter speed can be set to a maximum of 30 minutes. Using the mechanical shutter, the camera is able to take 10 frames per second in sequential high speed mode, and with an electronic shutter, it can take 30 frames per second. Sequential low speed shooting means the camera will continue to take pictures as long as the shutter button is held down but the camera will adjust focus, exposure, and white balance in between shots. Hence, it will be slower than the sequential high speed mode. Using sequential low speed shooting, the camera can shoot 6 frames per second using the mechanical shutter and 10 frames per second using the electronic shutter. You can choose the drive mode and shooting speed by pressing the button on top of the camera above the on-off lever. Alternatively, you can access the same options by pressing the OK button, which will take you to the control menu or to the super control panel, both of which will have the option to change the drive mode. After pressing the OK button, you can press the info button to change between the super control panel 
and a two-level menu being displayed on the right and bottom of the screen. You can also access the same options through the main menu system by pressing the menu button, then go to the basic shooting options indicated by a camera icon adjacent to the number one. Then select the bottom menu item, which contains the various options for drive mode. You can also choose which options should be displayed in this menu. So you can reduce the number of visible options for the drive mode to make you more efficient in the field when accessing these settings. You can do this by going to the customization menu D1. There are 18 possible drive modes, but when you're planning for an event, you might only need to change between a few of those quickly. For example, if you're doing portrait photography, you're unlikely to need the sequential high-speed shooting mode. Or if you're doing sports photography or wildlife photography, you're less likely to need to quickly switch to single shot drive mode. So by configuring this, you can operate the camera faster under time constraints that are imposed on you by external factors. You can change the settings for the maximum number of frames taken at each of the sequential shooting modes. This is useful if you don't want to end up with too many images every time you press and hold the shutter button or if you want to save space on your memory card. The memory card you use can have an impact on how fast you can continue to shoot at the maximum rate and write the images to storage. If the memory card being used is slow, then the buffer needs to be cleared so the shooting speed might be reduced. In addition to the self-timer option, the camera provides a function for interval shooting for creating time lapses. You can configure the camera to create a time lapse video from the pictures, in addition to storing the image files separately. There are various settings that can be configured in this menu in relation to resolution and timings for shooting time lapses, also known as interval shooting. The camera supports various bracketing functions, such as exposure bracketing, white balance bracketing, flash bracketing, ISO bracketing, focus bracketing, and art filter bracketing. Bracketing is a feature whereby the camera takes a series of shots, but changes the settings in between each shot. So if you used exposure bracketing and took three shots, the exposure level of those three shots would differ. So you could pick the best one out of the three pictures. Focus bracketing lets you take multiple pictures at different focus positions. The camera will move the focus point slightly further with each shot. You can configure how much the focus point will move with each shot, as well as how many shots should be taken. As part of post-processing, the captured images can be transferred to a computer and combined into a single picture with a large depth of field using software such as Olympus Workspace or Adobe Photoshop as well as other software applications that support focus stacking, which is the term used to describe combining pictures taken with different focus positions. In addition to using focus bracketing and performing focus stacking as part of the post-processing flow, the EM5 Mark III has an in-camera focus stacking feature that lets you take eight photos at different focal positions and automatically combine them into a single photo. There will be a 7% crop on the final image created by the in-camera focus stacking function. There are a limited number of lenses that are supported for this functionality. These are mainly from the MZUCO Pro series lenses. The lens I am currently using with this camera is not compatible with this feature, so the menu item is disabled. There is more flexibility with using focus bracketing and doing the focus stacking in post-processing, but it is also substantially more time-consuming. So keep that in mind when you decide to choose your approach. The camera has a HDR function, whereby it takes a series of pictures at different exposure levels and combines them into a single high contrast image. HDR stands for high dynamic range, which fits the produced output of these images, as these pictures can produce high detail in both shadows and highlights due to having varying exposure levels followed by combining the series of images into one. In addition to the in-camera HDR function, the camera also allows you to take a series of pictures for combining in post-processing, instead of on the camera for producing the HDR image.
You can configure the number of shots and exposure differences for taking the photos, then combine them using appropriate software on a computer. The camera has a feature called Pro Capture, which pre-captures images before the shutter button is fully pressed. Pro Capture starts capturing photos from the moment the shutter button is pressed halfway down and captures up to 14 frames prior to the moment the shutter button is fully pressed. While the shutter button is halfway down, the last 14 frames will be temporarily stored in a buffer. If the shutter button is pressed fully, then those images will be saved to the memory card, otherwise they will be discarded. This feature helps capture unpredictable and fast-moving subjects such as birds taking flight or for sports photography when the exact moment an action happens is unpredictable. So using this feature, you have the chance to go back in time to get the exact shot you want. You can limit the total number of frames that you wish to capture when using Pro Capture. There are two settings for Pro Capture, a high speed mode and a low speed mode. The high speed Pro Capture mode allows taking 30 frames per second, but the camera will only autofocus on the first shot when the shutter is pressed halfway. The same is true for exposure and white balance in the high speed mode. So in the Pro Capture high speed mode, focus, exposure and white balance are locked at the values when the shutter button is pressed halfway. Hence, the high speed mode is good for scenarios where the distance of the subject to the camera does not change. Whereas the low speed Pro Capture mode allows taking 10 frames per second, but autofocus will function between each shot. So if the subject is moving away or towards the camera, then this option might be more appropriate to keep the subject in focus throughout the frames, as well as for scenarios where there could be a change in exposure or white balance. The camera can shoot video both when the camera is in movie mode as well as when the camera is in one of the still picture modes using the record button on top. It has a 420 chroma subsampling rate with 8-bit color depth for internal recording to the SD card and a 422 chroma subsampling rate with 8-bit color depth for external recordings via HDMI. It lets you shoot 4K video at 24 frames per second, 25 frames per second and 30 frames per second. The camera also supports DCI Cinema 4K, which has the slightly wider 17 by 9 aspect ratio in comparison to the normal 16 by 9 4K footage. The 17 by 9 aspect ratio is not available for lower resolutions. The frame rate for Cinema 4K is fixed at 24 frames per second. This is recorded internally in IPB compression with a maximum bit rate of around 237 megabits per second. All 4K video footage is encoded with IPB compression and have a maximum bitrate of 102 megabits per second. And the maximum bitrate for Full HD 1080p when encoded with IPB compression is 52 megabits per second. And if the 1080p video is encoded in all I, then the maximum bitrate will be 202 megabits per second. Although the camera supports both IPB and all I compressions, all I cannot be used for 4K video at any frame rate, and it cannot be used for frame rates above 30 frames per second for 1080p videos. You can shoot 1080p video at 24, 25, 30, 50, and 60 frames per second. Although a matching 180 degree shutter angle is missing for video shot at 60 frames per second, there is a 1 over 100 shutter speed and a 1 over 125 shutter speed to choose from instead of the 1 over 120, which would match the 180 degree shutter angle rule. You can overcome this limit by enabling flicker scan in movie mode and then adjust the exact shutter speed to your desired number at increments of less than 1. So it is possible to set the shutter speed to 1 over 120, but it is less straightforward. The flicker scan feature is only available in shutter priority and manual mode, since those are the only two modes where you have control over the shutter speed, whereas the camera will automatically manage the shutter speed in the other modes. When using flicker scan, the increments at which the shutter speed can be changed are not constant. In my experience, the smallest increment is 0.1 and the largest increment is 1. Due to the varying increment size, sometimes the shutter speed might not land on the exact number that you want. For example, it might land on 120.1 instead of 120 exactly. 
In this case, you can go up and down to the maximum or minimum shutter speed or use a different dial to adjust the number again. In my experience, this has worked and I managed to get to the exact shutter speed, but maybe the time spent doing this isn't worth the effort. The camera has a high speed movie mode that shoots 1080p video at 120 frames per second and stores the encoded video as a slow motion clip with your desired frame rate. You can configure the frame rate at which the high speed video should be encoded for slow motion playback in order to match the rest of your normal speed video footage. You can choose 24, 25, 30, 50 or 60 frames per second to slow down the footage accordingly. The high speed video has a 1080p resolution and produces a maximum bitrate of 50 megabits per second. The high speed video doesn't have audio, so if you want to record the sound, you need a separate device. The high speed video mode does not have an exact matching 180 degree shutter angle equivalent, so you can use 1 over 250 or 1 over 200 of a second shutter speed. Alternatively, you can use the flicker scan workaround to get the exact shutter speed of 1 over 240. One of the reasons why the shutter angle might be important to some people is because they want to mix video footage which has been shot on different cameras while keeping the same look and feel. The camera has a micro HDMI connector which lets you output a clean video signal at 8-bit color depth and 422 chroma sub sampling rate. You can choose to use a clean video output signal or include on-screen information for monitoring purposes. If 4K or DCI Cinema 4K is selected as the video recording resolution, the menu item for changing the HDMI output mode will be disabled from choosing to show or hide on-screen information. It doesn't output raw video via HDMI, but you can output a flat movie picture mode and apply a lot to it in post-processing for color grading tasks using Blackmagic's DaVinci Resolve. The lot can be downloaded from the Olympus website. Sound will also be recorded via HDMI. The camera can be operated by a TV remote control when connected to a TV that supports HDMI control. The camera has a maximum recording time of 29 minutes, so the maximum length video that the camera can record in one continuous shoot is 29 minutes. The maximum file size is 4 gigabytes, so if you record a long video clip, it will be broken down into multiple files, even though the camera will shoot continuously. The 4 GB limit equates to 10 minutes and 41 seconds of 60 frames per second 1080p video, or 5 minutes and 21 seconds of 30 frames per second 4K video. If you use audio quality of 24 bit with 96 kHz sampling rate, then the duration of the videos will be slightly less. For example, 1080p video with 60 frames per second will last 10 minutes instead of 10 minutes and 41 seconds. When using manual video mode, auto ISO cannot be used. So if you set the aperture, shutter speed and frame rate, the camera cannot automatically adjust ISO to get the right exposure. You can switch to one of the automatic modes for video, such as shutter priority, aperture priority or program auto, and that will let the camera adjust exposure automatically. But it is not clear whether the camera uses ISO to adjust exposure or if it also changes aperture and shutter speed, which could impact how the video footage looks. There isn't a nice practical way to get around this limitation, but keep in mind that if you are using a fixed aperture lens, such as the 9mm f8 fisheye lens, then you can achieve auto ISO without changes to your aperture by using the shutter priority mode while knowing that only the ISO can change. Extended ISO settings cannot be used when in video mode, and the menu option is disabled, so the ISO range in movie mode is strictly between 200 and 6400. Some settings are shared between video mode and photo mode, such as aperture, shutter speed and ISO, so switching them while in video mode will also be visible if the mode dial is rotated to still picture mode. The camera has interval recording for stitching multiple pictures into a video clip or to store images for later conversion to a clip on a computer. The camera has an anti-flicker live view feature that helps reduce flicker when under lights that pulse at similar frequency to the electricity power supply. 
The camera can automatically detect the flicker and adjust accordingly, or you can manually set it to 50 Hz or 60 Hz, depending on the power supply of the shoot location. The camera also has a slightly different option for dealing with flicker, called anti-flicker shooting, where the camera automatically detects the flicker frequency and times the shutter release accordingly. This functionality will only work when the mechanical shutter is being used in still picture mode. The camera also has a feature called flicker scan, which can be used in movie mode and for still pictures when using the silent electronic shutter. Once you enable this feature, it allows you to check the stripe patterns caused by flickering light sources on the camera screen so that you can adjust the shutter speed to a number where such patterns cannot be seen. I've tried to demonstrate this by filming my monitor. The camera has stereo onboard microphones located on the top of the camera. It also has a microphone jack on the left of the camera. You can connect an external recorder such as the Olympus LS100 to the camera and sync the start stop of video recording with the audio recording. The camera doesn't have a headphone jack, but if you are using an external recorder, this might not be an issue. On the previous version of this camera, the EM5 Mark II, you could purchase a grip which had a headphone jack on it, but the grip for the EM5 Mark III doesn't have a headphone port. The camera has an onboard speaker which is located above the menu button. The audio is recorded in stereo mode and can be set to record at either 16-bit depth and 48 kHz sampling frequency or 24-bit and 96 kHz sampling rate. The higher audio quality settings will consume more storage and use up slightly more of the SD card transfer speed bandwidth. So keep that in mind if you have a slow SD card or limited storage. If you are using the onboard microphone to record audio when filming, make sure you switch off wind noise reduction because it really damages the audio quality of your clip while trying to suppress wind noise. The camera allows you to customize the functionality of physical buttons and dials of the camera to your liking. To reassign functionality of various buttons for still picture mode, go to the customization menu, then choose submenu B, which I believe stands for button, and there you will find all customization options that relate to buttons and dials. There's a menu item named button function, which contain a list of buttons that can have their functionality customized and what functionality can be tied to each button. The same feature exists for movie mode, but the button function submenu is located in the video menu. I'm going through some of these to give you an idea of what options are available and how I have configured my camera. I mainly use the camera for video recording, so I have configured the buttons in a way that will allow me to easily view or change settings that I am most concerned about when shooting video or frequently change. It is even possible to assign multiple functions to a single button, whereby you would hold down the button and use a dial to scroll through its functionality. You can also configure which functions should appear as part of that list by checking or unchecking them in the customization menu tab under D1. I don't use this feature, but it is an interesting concept. The camera has a single custom mode entry on the mode dial, but there are three custom modes that can be saved and used. So the first custom mode can be used by rotating the mode dial as well as through the menu. The other two custom mode settings can be recalled by going to the menu instead of using the mode dial. The custom mode functionality does not work for movie mode. The camera has a preview button in front akin to depth of field preview buttons which are found on SLR cameras. You can configure what function this button should perform or leave it on the default setting which is depth of field preview. The camera has a number of modes which help the novice photographer learn more about photography and have some fun, such as the scene mode, art mode and auto modes. It has 16 art filters in addition to 10 picture profiles. If you set the mode dial to art, the art filters will be presented on the screen with a live preview of the art effect. 
you may need to press the OK button if the art filter effects are not presented on the screen. You can access these art filters from the menu as well, and they can be used in other modes. The art filters can also be used in video mode, although some art filters and movie effects may result in a dropped frame rate. In addition to the art filters, there are five movie effects available for when shooting videos. For example, there is a movie effect called Old Film, which randomly applies damage and dust-like noise similar to old movies. The camera has a scene mode with various preset options that help users to take good photos without having to configure camera settings or use the manual mode. The scene mode has six themes that contain a total of 22 scene modes, which helps the novice user select an appropriate option while checking sample images. For example, it has a panorama mode where you can take up to 10 pictures that can afterwards be joined on a computer using Olympus Workspace to create a panorama image. I recommend holding the camera vertically so that you get a wider view from the ground to the sky when taking panorama shots. The camera provides on-screen guides to help align the frames as well as direction for the next frame to be taken. Direction of movement can be changed using the arrow buttons. You can also switch from horizontal to vertical mode using the arrow buttons. You cannot create the panorama picture on the camera, so this is something you have to do afterwards on a computer using Olympus Workspace software or an alternative software application. Comparing the panorama mode on this camera with the Olympus OMD EM10 Mark IV, the panorama mode on the EM10 Mark IV is far easier to use as you only press the shutter once, then move the camera along with an on-screen guide arrow until the end of the scene is reached. And the EM10 Mark IV also stitches the photos together on the camera, so you don't have to do any work on the computer afterwards. Also on the EM10 Mark IV, you can use the touch screen in scene mode for selecting a scene mode or returning to the list of scene modes, whereas on the EM5 Mark III, you have to use the arrow buttons and the OK button. One of the interesting aspects of Olympus cameras is that they provide a lot of tools on the camera for post-processing images, which other camera brands don't provide. You can do some editing of photos and videos on the camera. For example, you can trim the beginning or end of a video. It is possible to save a frame from a movie clip as a picture on the camera. You can fix red eye in pictures taken with a flash. You can crop images. You can adjust the brightness and saturation of pictures. And you can create a black and white or sepia copies of an image on the camera. Or you can use art bracketing to apply any art filter to existing pictures all on the camera. The camera has a feature called multiple exposure, whereby you take two frames and overlay them into a single picture. Alternatively, you can take a picture and combine it with an existing picture on the camera. You can overlay up to three pictures into a single image. The camera has a function called keystone compensation, which corrects a type of distorted perspective that can result from proximity to a subject or lens type and focal length. For example, when taking pictures of a building, it might appear that the building is falling backward. Or when taking pictures of a notepad, it may seem that it is getting narrower towards the top. Keystone compensation can fix these issues in camera. There will be a slight crop to the image when this feature is used. To use this feature, you switch on keystone compensation from the menu and use the front and back dials to correct the keystone effect. The camera allows you to enter copyright details to be included in the metadata of pictures. So all your images will be automatically tagged with details that you enter in this setting, such as your name, website, or contact details. You can configure the camera to allow wireless connectivity when the camera is off. This will allow your camera to complete uploading photos even if you have switched off your camera, but it will consume more battery power when this mode is enabled. You review pictures and videos by pressing the button with the play icon on it. While viewing a photo, you can press the info button to display more or less information. Also, you can view two pictures side by side for comparison. This is referred to as light box display. You can choose how many pictures and video clips should be shown on a single page when viewing photos by using the back dial to zoom in or out. 
you can configure how many levels this zoom functionality should have by going to the customization menu D1. There is also an option to view content based on the date they were taken. This calendar view is something I find useful when going through a lot of content and wanting to find the right item. The app allows you to control your camera remotely. You can see the camera's live view on your smartphone screen. You can specify the autofocus point. It lets you control zoom for electronic zoom lenses. You can release the shutter to take a photo. It lets you adjust the shooting mode, such as manual mode or art mode. It also lets you change the drive mode to choose between single shot, burst, and self-timer. The app uses both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and it requires scanning a QR code to pair the devices. I don't know how easy the integration is to tag photos with GPS coordinates coming from your phone, but it is mentioned in the documentation, so it can be done. This camera meets the requirements that I had for a camera, but I will summarize the problems with this camera for awareness of others. The camera is currently not supported for use with Olympus webcam software, so you won't be able to use the camera as a webcam, even though the previous version of this camera, the EM5 Mark II, works with the webcam software. The next strap eyelets on this camera make noise, which is captured in videos. I have removed them, but the part that they connect to protrudes, which make it marginally more difficult to fit into a small pocket or bag. The camera doesn't have a headphone port, and neither did its predecessor, the EM5 Mark II. But the EM5 Mark II had a compatible external grip, which could be purchased separately that provided a headphone jack. There is an external attachable grip which you can purchase separately for this camera named ECG5. This grip provides a larger grip for holding the camera as well as a shutter button and a front dial. However, it does not provide any other functionalities such as extra batteries, headphone jack or the ability to run the camera from another power source. The previous version of this camera, the EM5 Mark II, had a compatible grip which provided an extra battery, a headphone jack and could be plugged into an AC adapter for infinite power, in addition to providing portrait grip with shutter button, front dial, and two buttons on the back. So even though this camera is better than its predecessor, the battery grip accessory is definitely a step backward. I think it would make more sense not to create the battery grip for this camera rather than creating one which is inferior to the one available for the previous version of this camera. If you had an EM5 Mark II camera, you could get a significant upgrade by purchasing the HLD8 battery grip, as the additional hardware and features would bring it on par with the EM1 Mark II. However, with the EM5 Mark III, the only way to upgrade would be to purchase a new camera such as the EM1 Mark III or the EM1X. The option to charge the camera through the USB port wasn't available in the previous version of this camera, the EM5 Mark II, but using the external battery grip, it could run infinitely from an AC adapter, whereas powering the EM5 Mark III using USB power does not allow you to operate the camera at the same time. So you have to switch off the camera to charge it from the USB port, which makes the previous version of this camera superior for scenarios when you want to run the camera for a very long time, such as for time lapses. The previous version of this camera had a magnesium alloy body, whereas this camera is made from plastic. The advantage of a plastic body is that the camera is lighter as a result. While browsing online photography forums, I encountered a few instances of people breaking the tripod mount of this camera, particularly when hanging their camera from the tripod mount using a strap or while carrying a tripod with the camera hanging from it. The previous version of this camera had a larger battery, which in theory could have provided more lifetime if it was used for this camera. However, the advantage of a smaller battery is that it is lighter. In movie mode, you cannot select auto ISO in manual mode. This means you cannot explicitly set both the shutter speed and aperture and let the camera dynamically adjust ISO when recording a video. The camera doesn't have OM Log 400, but you can output a flat movie picture mode and apply a lot to it in post-processing for color grading tasks using Blackmagic's DaVinci Resolve. The camera has a flip screen instead of a tilt screen, which I find more difficult to work with. But this is a personal preference and depends on the type of work that you do and how you use the camera. Focusing modes cannot be changed while video recording is in progress. 
so the video recording needs to be stopped prior to changing focus mode. Movie stabilization cannot be changed while video recording is in progress, so the video recording needs to be stopped in order to change the stabilization setting. Overall, I am impressed with the features of this camera, particularly given its size and weight. It is the smallest and lightest Olympus OMD camera, which still retains all the features and functionality of a professional camera. The EM10 Mark IV is slightly smaller and lighter, but lacks a lot of useful features such as Pro Capture, high res mode, microphone jack, high quality audio, and 1080p high speed video. The more expensive EM1 Mark III and EM1X have some minor advantages over this camera, such as better ergonomics, dual card slots, bigger batteries, and some additional features and capabilities. However, in terms of basic functionality and image quality in real life practical uses, this camera matches the higher end OMD cameras at a lower price point and substantially smaller and lighter form factor. It even shares a lot of the same hardware with those cameras, such as the image sensor. I already own the EM10 Mark IV, which satisfies almost all of my requirements, but I decided to purchase this camera because it had a microphone port. Having purchased the EM5 Mark III, I have benefited from some of the other features, such as better menu system and user experience, better image stabilization, higher quality, high speed video, clean HDMI signal output, DCI Cinema 4K, higher quality audio, faster and more accurate autofocus, separate compartments for battery and memory card, more customization options, and weather sealing. This camera and the EM10 Mark IV have the same battery, which means I've ended up with a spare battery as well as an external battery charger in addition to the USB charger which came with the EM10. So I can use these peripherals with either cameras and treat the EM10 as a backup body since the lenses are already compatible. When it comes to small and light cameras with interchangeable lens mount, I have not come across any cameras that are better than the EM5 Mark III and the EM10 Mark IV. Aside from the camera bodies, there are some really small and light lenses that go with these cameras that make them portable without sacrificing too much on features. Anyway, please let me know if you have any questions about this camera or if you would like me to demo a feature or functionality in more detail.